So yeah, uh, I want to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, uh, Professor Chris Stubbs. Uh, I tried to follow suit with uh, the introduction yesterday, and ChatGPT didn't give me quite as satisfying of uh, introductory remarks. It told me, I think he's a professor at Harvard, at least as of April 2023. I think that's still true. Uh, so Chris is a faculty in the uh, physics and astronomy departments at Harvard. Uh, he has a very long list of recognitions in his bio. For example, he's a fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, scientifically, he's worked a lot in the fields of cosmology, uh, particle physics, gravitation. In particular, his research is actually very important to me because he's doing very hard work to make sure that the Vera Rubin Observatory delivers the highest quality data possible. And I'm going to spend the next decade working on that data. So thank you, Chris. Um, but uh, one of the reasons it's exciting to have Chris here today is he's the Dean of Sciences at Harvard. Um, and he's been doing a lot of work to make the place uh, a better institution. And in particular, uh, he's drank the uh, ChatGPT Kool-Aid like I have. And so we chatted over coffee and realized like, uh, we're both very enthusiastic about it. And we felt that uh, more people should be enthusiastic about it uh, and wanted to kind of uh, spread the Kool-Aid around. Um, and so uh, without uh, taking up more time, I want to introduce uh, Chris Stubbs. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I'm going to give kind of an overview talk and frame it in the context of questions, because I think we're at the stage here of stumbling to uh, formulate the right kind of questions to guide our work. So here's the outline. I'll frame it in terms of questions. I'll give you some vignettes and examples of things that work and don't work in both the educational and the research domain. And then I want to spend a fair bit of time about norms and expectations of establishing a social contract amongst ourselves about using these tools. So question number one, does generative AI pose an existential threat to current practices in STEM and higher education, or is it a remarkable opportunity? This one I'll answer, and the answer is yes, right? But it's really, I think, an interesting turning point because this whole technology changes a lot of the way you think about computers. So I think it's a sort of natural progression from, I actually once in my life wrote a similar for microprocessors, but then there were higher level languages and then there were better higher level languages. Now all of a sudden you can speak English to a computer. That's a big deal. I think the notion that if we're all so hardwired that you ask a computer to do something twice and you get the same answer, and that's manifestly not true here. And that's something that I think has non-trivial ramifications. I think it lowers the barrier of entry to sophisticated computing for a wide range of disciplines and for a large range of applications. And all those taken together mean that as if we weren't challenged enough already in a fact-free society, how do you do truth validation and verification of answers that you get when you interact with these systems? So I think it's really quite interesting. There's a, there's a paper that was put out by a group of people in business schools that took the Boston Consulting Group and similar to the results that we heard yesterday in the classroom, did an A-B comparison of give some people chat GPT and don't give it to other people, and the performance histogram just shifts to the right. But I think the more interesting point is on the bottom left of the chart, which is they point out that there's kind of a jagged edge of performance here. There are some things that these generative AI tools are good at and some things that they're not good at. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time trying to map that out as we go forward here this morning. Next major point is this is moving really, really fast. So this bar chart shows the progression with different versions of large language models about how well they do in trying to become a lawyer. So this is challenging GPT with uh, the bar exam. So the bar shows that it passes the bar exam. Do you get that, the bar, the bar exam, okay? And, but the real important point is the trajectory and the speed of the trajectory. So I think a lot of people try this out and go hrumph and toss it aside because of its shortcomings. I think that's a big mistake because this is moving so fast, just wait a year and chances are many of those shortcomings won't be there anymore. So I think the sort of premature dismissal is inappropriate. So if this disrupts our overall model of higher education, to my mind, we face two related challenges. Number one is how do we use these tools to enhance student learning? 
And number two is, how do we teach our students to be proficient, ethical, and responsible users of these tools? And that's basically take a big step back and rethink all of the undergraduate education that we give to people. So I don't know how I ever decided that this would be a good idea, but Logan and I are teaching a class that starts on Tuesday that's an attempt to force Harvard to confront this by offering a general education elective that satisfies the science, technology, and society part of our distribution requirements that's meant to be a survey overview of how this impacts the liberal arts. And I think a big element of that is exploring the thinking and writing process. So just bear with me a second here. I'm going to change screens and show you here an example of a custom application. So one of the things we're going to do is give them a writing assignment. And I want to highlight for you how easy it is now, as of a few months, to generate a custom constrained generative AI tutorial component, right? So one of the things we're going to give these students is a generative AI assisted thinking writing assignment. The first stage in that is I need to frame what I'm going to do, come up with an outline for the paper, and identify appropriate resources. So I generated an explorer assistant, and all you do is you say, I want to write a paper about something or other. So I spent the Christmas break in Costa Rica, had a great time, saw anteaters. So my example is, I want to write a paper that explores the population history of anteaters in Costa Rica with particular attention to habitat destruction. The audience is undergraduate science majors. So it says, OK, here's an outline. Not only does it generate the outline, but all these little quotation marks are actually the sources that it drew from. And those are not hallucinated. They're real links, and they're really there. And it comes down to the end. And I say, well, can you find me more research papers on population density? OK, here are some more papers. Oops, no, you said there were going to be more. That's only one. OK, here are some more. And now I'm a lazy student. And I say, thanks. Now please write the introduction to the paper. And here's where the guardrails and constraints come in. And it says, no, no, no. I'm here to assist you with making outlines. I'm not going to write the introduction for you. And at the very bottom, it says, good luck with your writing. OK? So, that's an example of a constrained uh, tool, but let me just show you sort of how easy this is to do, because I can come over here into the edit this GPT tool. Doop, doop, doop. I can come over here into the edit the GPT tool, and in configure, there's just a, a sort of system prompt that tells it what I want it to do. So that's now built into the functionality of GPT Plus and is I think facilitating our ability to make these custom uh, tutor systems, OK? So taking a step back and looking at the life of a STEM faculty member, what are the possible domains of applicability of this new toolkit? So breaking it into three pieces of what we do, which is scholarship, teaching, and service to the institution, here's my list. So the things above the dashed line are things that are currently viable and sensible. The things below the dashed line, for either ethical or technical reasons, are not currently appropriate or accessible. So it includes, it's really good at generating outlines of things, be it courses, lectures, papers, whatever. You can do active learning assistant, like Logan showed us yesterday. You can draft assignments. You can refine assignments. You can assess assessments. You can generate lecture outlines. Like I just showed you, you can make custom tutor or assistance for different components of courses. I think there's a real big opportunity in STEM to do instructional lab data reduction in a very streamlined way. I think that's a really cool thing. You can add a Slack channel agent, so a generator, I think, can be in the discussion with students on a Slack channel. I did a trick of uploading a grade sheet and asking it to generate a rank-ordered list and write a friendly email to students that weren't doing so well. And I'll show you examples of generating LaTeX as we go. Things that we're not doing so far include automated grading. That's a really interesting discussion. Self-paced courses where the entire course is uh, you know, sort of provided by an AI thing. I think there's a cool example that Logan suggested, which is take all the content of a course, the lectures, the homework, the final, upload it to a GPT thing and ask, what skills does a student need in order to succeed on the final? that they weren't taught in the course, which is really identifying the implicit prerequisites that we have for intro courses. I think that's really cool. 
And I love the idea of using generative AI tools to allow the incoming freshman class before they come to campus to self-assess their skill set in preparation for our introductory courses. Okay, going down the admin side, HR functions, budget analysis, you can upload an Excel spreadsheet and ask it questions about financial resource allocations, automated generation of meeting transcripts, long-term fusion with other parts of our IT systems, asking questions about university policy, automatic generation of web pages, and having it do all of our committee and service work on our behalf. What we're not doing are compliance monitoring, honest to gosh accounting, recommendation letter generation, I'm gonna talk about that later, and screening of applications, I'm gonna talk about that later too. On the research side, it's made my coding a factor of 10 more efficient, that's a low bar. It's really good at information synthesis, paper outline generation, generating papers, editing papers, generating graphics, real-time interfaces to SQL. On the edge of doing knowledge discovery, and I haven't heard anyone talk about project management. So it's a wide range of things that you could imagine this stuff helping us with, and it's pretty cool. So I've tried it for code generation. I'll show you an example of real-time querying of Pandas data frames in a browser. I had an undergraduate who worked on a project. His English was not his first language. He wrote a first draft of the instrument description paper, and I read it, and I just wilted. Between it being his first paper and not English as a first language, it was a week's worth of work for me to go through and provide critique and corrections. And I said, hey, do me a favor. You upload it to GPT with the following prompt. You are the editor of a technical journal. This manuscript was submitted. Please provide suggestions in terms of clarity of expression, content, and so on. Take what GPT tells you to do and give me the next version. The next version came in and I'm like, this is one evening's worth of work. I can, I can deal with this, right? So that was a real time saver for me. We can talk about whether or not that was an ethical thing for me to do. Um, I generated fake video of myself. That was really easy and kind of cool. It's me talking French in words that I never said. Um, you can enhance job ads for postdoc hiring and make your jobs look more attractive. I did that once. I think the notion of summarizing real time inputs in the classroom is cool. And uh, Logan and I are using it for this entire survey course. The other thing I did was graphics for a book cover. So shameless self-promotion, I wrote a book. And the book is about big science projects and big collaborations, how they come to be, their sociology, their management. I sent it to a well-known press, <clears throat> MIT Press, who generated proposed cover art for a book about big science and big projects. And the graphical artist said, let's do a big chemistry flask. And I'm like, really? That doesn't really quite capture what I'm trying to get across in this book. And so I went to Midjourney and I said, hey, give me a thing about like lots of people working on really complicated stuff that really conveys what I'm trying to get across. And it gave me this, right? So graphical arts, pretty cool. But they won't print that on the cover because it's way too complicated. So um, here's another thing. I think it in this multimodal world, the representation of information between text, graphics, PDF, it all kind of gets to interconvert. And so Logan showed you an example of this, but you can literally just draw on a napkin a web page that you want, take a picture with your phone, upload the picture of what you want, and tell it, please generate the HTML, cut and paste the HTML on your computer, open the file, and you get the thing on the bottom right in like two minutes, okay? So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, as far as a time-saving and efficiency tool, on the left is my chicken-scratching handwriting of a kinematics problem of you throw a ball up in the air, how much time does it take before it lands back in your hand? So I kind of wrote this out, and then I said, hey, please convert this into LaTeX. So it generates the LaTeX. There's the LaTeX on the top right. But it did a little bit more. It sort of added a few words, like look at line four. Using the equation V of t is equal to something, I never wrote that down over here, right? So it embellished it a little bit. That's great if you're an expert, but if you're a non-expert, the thing on the right is not particularly informative. So why don't you say to GPT, well, why don't you add some water and expand this a little bit and make it more comprehensive for an undergraduate student in a mechanics course? 
So the prompt says, can you expand, provide more material, add to the LaTeX, and then here's, here's like, how in the hell can it do this? The other thing that I said was, oh, and please provide the question to which I gave you the answer. Right? And so sure enough, actually, there's the question. I never wrote down what the question was. So it infers what the question is, writes a bunch of tutorial material, and does something that basically I don't have any corrections to make to. So I think that's kind of cool and magical. Um, but here's a total fail. So clearly, they did not take the Horowitz and Hill electronics book and put it in the training data. So I drew a sketch of a you know pedestrianly simple op amp circuit, and I'm like, Okay, I want a better, I want a better circuit. And I wasn't clear in the prompt. I said a circuit diagram that I'd like you to improve. It thought I meant improve the circuit. So it tells me, oh, you should put a filter capacitor. No, no, no. I want a better circuit. I want a better picture. And no matter how hard I tried, I got pictures like the stuff on the right. Okay, like some vague artist notion of circuitry in some crazy bizarre world. So this is an example of like things that you would think would be easy. It doesn't do, and other things, like, please tell me what the question was for which I gave you the answer, like the Jeopardy version of GPT. It does amazingly well. So this was a really cool learning example for us. So like Kevin said, I'm working on this big telescope project, the Rubin Observatory. We're taking early commissioning astronomical observations on the top of a mountain in Chile. That information goes into a data structure, into a, into a database. And when you're in the process of commissioning and debugging these systems, it's really valuable to have a interactive data browsing kind of capability in a notebook environment, okay? So we wrote a make API calls GPT facilitated data browsing assistant that runs in this notebook structure. So I can say, please make a histogram of mount image degradation. The mount doesn't perform right, it jitters around for all images that have a particular disperser in the optical beam. And it says, okay, we go, we, we've told it to be highly verbose. So it says, okay, to do that, I need to filter the data frame. It tells me what code it's gonna run. And then actually, because we're a little apprehensive, we have it tell us how much did this actually cost to execute this little query over on your side. So it tells us how much it cost to run the query. It makes this histogram and that's all really cool. But embedding this in the notebook environment lets two things happen. One is the code is actually executing on our side so we can capture in the notebook the Python code that it generates, but almost more importantly, the intermediate data structures that are produced along the way persist in the notebook environment, right? So it's a very efficient way to just breeze through and just ask, hey, you know, I think this might be correlated with that, yes or no, boom, here's the plot, right? Is that doing things that we couldn't do on our own? Answer, no, but no kidding, for real, it's like 10 times faster. So it's highly empowering in this sort of data browsing uh, venue. So I tried to make a bit of a radar plot here to sketch out radially my instantaneous assessment of a few capabilities to really try to visualize this jagged edge of performance. So performance is rated from zero to five, with five being better than zero. It's a radial plot. Different capabilities are shown at different azimuth angles. So starting at the top, is it really good at generating long narratives? Actually, not really. It sort of loses its train of thought. There are output token restrictions. If you say, GPT, please write me a novel, doesn't work terribly well. Is it good at generating short narratives, two or three pages, answer yes. Is it good at outlining? Yeah, it's really good at outlining. Is it good at graphics? Well, you saw some examples of yes and some examples of no. Is it good at synthesis and summaries? By and large, I'd say yeah, maybe I underrated it there. Is it good on the code side? I think it's really good at the really boring parts of like all the indices and all the structure and all the loops and all that kind of stuff. Huge time saver. But in my experience, often in the core algorithmic piece, eh, you know, needs a, needs a couple of iterations to really get where you want to get, which I think highlights one of the conclusions that I've drawn about this is that the real sweet spot is the product of domain expertise and competence with these systems. 
and one or the other individually is not gonna be competitive in the future, okay? And in particular, just turning ignorant people loose with this tool is like a toddler with a chainsaw, right? I mean, just wreckage ensues. And so I think one of our challenges that we face as educators is how do we incentivize undergraduates to invest the level of intellectual effort to attain domain mastery so that they can use these tools well? When these tools offer such a seductive shortcut for every assignment that we have traditionally ever given them? That's a really interesting question. And my answer about how we incentivize them at our institution is grades, okay, just to be blunt. So I think we need to think our way through that whole, that whole situation. So I think there is this jagged edge, and I think domain expertise is essential. So what do we have going now? Much like we heard yesterday about LIGO, this project has been running for 20 years. It has an unbelievable amount of documentation that reside in write once, read never repositories that are unsearchable. So we're vacuuming up the 20 year history of project documentation and putting a natural language front end in front of it. Um, I'm, it once you think about things this way, it really changes the way you think about how we do science. So I was down there at this Rubin Observatory and the control room has all these computer monitors with all these plots that a bunch of software engineers thought would be useful to astronomers when they were on the telescope. So one of the things that happens is you're up on the mountaintop and the wind speed is going up, 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 and there's a limit to the wind speed at which you can operate the system. And if you wanna plan the night's observations, it's good to try to predict when is the wind likely to hit the wind limit so like we're done. And the current way you do that is you click through all these screens and if you're lucky, you find wind speed versus time. And then in your head, you like extrapolate this curve, oh, like 3 a.m. I think it's gonna happen. And now it's like, no, 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 wait a minute. That's all in a database. It's a simple extrapolation. I should be able to say, hey, AI entity, give me a prediction with associated uncertainties of when the wind is gonna hit the limit. I just get the answer back. So the idea that you can just really interact with these experimental systems where you really just ask, flat out ask the question to which you want the answer, it really changes the way you think about things. And I think in particular, observatory operations. And uh, so yeah, ah, Logan and I have this course that starts on Tuesday. We're also doing pilot projects in the administrative domain. I'm not gonna spend any time on that, but like facilitating our whole grant compliance process. So now in the look ahead part, here's a question. Is, so this is, a lot of this has been making things more efficient. Is there a prospect of generative AI systems making truly independent intellectual breakthroughs? And I think that entails having these AI systems migrate upstream in the scientific process. At the moment, we're thinking about them as making graphs for your paper and writing your paper and that kind of stuff. I think it's gonna migrate to the left and move into the domain of knowledge extraction or insight generation. And I think also a thing that's coming uh, where we already have some examples is integration with the real world, like sensor inputs and 3D printer outputs and driving PCR machines and who knows what, right? So we're basically already there. We saw an example of the yesterday. There are papers coming out where these tools have been used in an integrative way, top to bottom through the whole scientific stack and have done things that the authors claim were previously not possible. I think that then makes you think, okay, so let's look way down the road. Are we gonna face a collision between the intrinsic lack of reproducibility in these systems and the scientific method that relies on replication? So there was an article in Nature, I sat up one weekend and worried about this for a while, and I think we should think ahead because interestingly, even if you set the temperature of these things to zero, it's still not completely replicable for, for re reasons that nobody fully understands. And we should start thinking about what are the mitigations gonna be. So one is you just basically do a generative AI Monte Carlo and make a probability distribution of the outputs that you get. Okay, that's one possible thing to do. I think the whole replication challenge that we face, it's already the case in projects that we did 10 years ago, we have a hard time reproducing the results because the sysadmin people change the version of Python and things get stale and software is brittle. So I think similarly, we need to capture virtual machines with the entire context and training set. And we talked about this a little bit, you know, we're kind of working our way 
around some of the limitations in these commercial systems, should the science community be thinking about specifying and building science-optimized generative AI systems in the future? So on the educational side, we should step back, deconstruct everything, think about what we're trying to achieve and assess appropriately. That's a good thing. I talked about the need to incentivize students. This notion of sort of custom tutor friend on your shoulder helping you learn things, I think is an extremely powerful idea, but it's not clear whether we should build that at this single assignment level, at the course level, at the entire major level, sort of where's the right place in the stack to do that, and how can we share them amongst ourselves? And then the whole philosophical, ethical, regulatory, economical, and personal factors should really be at the forefront. So let me shift to the ethical part, which I think in some ways the more interesting. Here are things that I have not used generative AI to do. Tempting though it may be, I've never used it to generate a letter of recommendation. I've never used it to generate text for proposals. I have put figures in proposals of AI output to try to get the DOE to give us money to do more incorporation into Rubin. I haven't done any automated grading, and I haven't done anything to do with this talk. This was actually all purely me, believe it or not. But, so here's an interesting edge case. I sit on the promotion and tenure committee for the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Those tenure dossiers include student evaluations of teaching. Some of those evaluations are numerical. That's an easy roll up across all courses, appears as a table. And then there are narrative student evaluations of people's teaching. And those narrative evaluations are often highly informative. But we had a tenure case where this person had taught so many classes with so many students that there were literally 100 plus pages of narrative student evaluations, okay? There's no way I can read and assimilate that. So within the framework of Harvard's privacy protected sandbox, I uploaded those narrative student evaluations and I asked for a summary for the major weaknesses and you know the predominant strengths of this person's teaching. And then after I got that, I kind of went and skimmed and spot checked and like, is this sort of roughly consistent? Answer yes, right? So a question for the room that we can explore during the question period is, was that an ethical use of this technology, right? I think it's an edge case and I think it's on the, on the side of, yeah, that was okay because the alternative was I wasn't gonna be able to synthesize that information in a reasonable amount of time. But I think those are the interesting kind of challenges that we face. So which of these are acceptable uses of generative AI? Number one, preparation of a manuscript. Right this second, if you use generative AI to generate a science paper and you send it to science, it's considered academic misconduct. If you send it to nature and you acknowledge its use, they will publish it. I think that's an interesting vignette of how we are not aligned in terms of our norms and expectations. Number two, okay, so what about just like touching up a manuscript after the fact? Number three, what about code development? These things are trained on the corpus of computer code that sits in GitHub and other places, many of which have interesting licensing structures. That licensing doesn't propagate into the code that GPT generates for you. It's as bad as the copyright problem with the training in the uh, narrative domain. So how are we gonna deal with that? Number four, for undergraduates, graduate students, postdoc staff and faculty who are applying to our institutions, should we advise them to use generative AI tools in the preparation of their application materials? ChatGPT will write a really good diversity, inclusion and belonging statement. Okay, how are we gonna handle that? Number five, a number of us are faced with doing performance evaluations of individuals. It's a job that many of us dread. It would be pretty easy to sidestep that and use generative AI. Number six, letters of recommendation. Number seven, generation proposal narrative. Number eight, what about PhD dissertations? Is it okay if your grad students use it to generate their outline? What about the boilerplate intro that everybody has to write? Should they have to do that from scratch, yes or no? And can we use it in the evaluation of these various applications that we get? So that leads these follow-up questions. How is this any different from spell checking or grammar tools that people use all the time and don't acknowledge? My answer is 
because the dynamic range of what it can do is so much larger that people don't know how to interpret if you tell them that you used it for, for what way it was done. What's the right way to provide a citation? Do you cite the open AI paper or are you just put in the acknowledgements? What's the right thing? Do we need versions as well? Is it a good idea to explicitly state to what extent you use generative AI tools? And who makes these rules anyway, right? Where does all this uh, sort of social contract come from? Part of the answer is federal agencies. So the feds are catching up here. In the tail end of the last calendar year, the NSF explicitly told people, you cannot upload proposals and have them evaluated in any way because that's a breach of confidentiality. The NIH was about six months ahead of the NSF. Their primary concern that they articulate is confidentiality of information that's in proposals leaking out. They wrote a interesting sort of a blog post that accompanied this, and that had a narrative that addressed the question of, okay, if I can't use it for proposal reviews, can I use it for proposal generation? And it says, we do not know or ask who wrote an application. It could have come from the PI, a postdoc, a professional grant writer, if you use an AI tool to help write your application, you do so at your own risk, okay? But, oh no, wait, I'm at Harvard, and we have this like privacy protected, never leaks out in the world, hermetically enclosed instantiation. Surely, surely we can have privacy protected automated proposal review in that context, and for financial, nope, you can't do that, because actually somebody might be able to get in there and read it. So, um, I just put that up as illustrations of us trying to find a way forward. And I think an interesting thing for us to discuss maybe in the panel session is answers to some of those questions. So um, let me just put those up to sort of prompt your thinking. And uh, I don't know, how are we doing here? Maybe take a few questions? Yeah, we've got time for a few. Okay. Uh, if people want to ask questions, you can come up to the mic. Or answers, questions or answers. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. So um, you know, there's, of course, the, the use of these tools in th things that we broadcast to the outside world. And then there's this use of these tools, the things that we do internally. And sometimes those things are linked. I mean, for me, when I'm writing something, that's often helping me to understand, you know, training this neural network. Um, so in your experience in using these tools, to what extent are the use of these tools, in some sense, sidestepping some of the internalization that you might otherwise be doing if you were doing things the more traditional way? And you know, in particular, not having enough time to either engage with the data set or, 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 or scrutinize, does it get you steps ahead in your experience? Or is it something where, oh yeah, that looks good enough, sidestep it, and then it actually doesn't you know, kind of get baked into your own brain? Yeah, so interesting. Interest, so, the, so the question is, in effect, I'll rephrase a little bit. Is there a pitfall of sort of becoming intellectually lazy? And have we somehow bypassed an important part of the process by using these tools to accelerate certain pieces? Is that a fair? Yeah, so if you take the example of evaluating something for a promotion case, I yeah. can imagine that you got that, 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 that text, and was it a situation where that text was absolutely essential, or was it a case where actually, you know, two hours later you forgot about it, and when it came to actually, you know, advocating for someone or, or, not, or not, it wasn't kind of in your brain in the same way that it would have been had you had to wade through those thousand comments? Are you implicitly asking me the extent to which Harvard takes teaching into account when we tenure our faculty? <laughs> surely, surely you're not asking me that question. Um, I think in that particular instance, the individual had a certain reputation on campus already. So I think I had a strong Bayesian prior going in. And I think it was more a case of, is there a red flag here that I missed, right? Um, so I feel comfortable about that side of things. To your, to your early part of your question, which was in my experience, do I feel like I'm missing, is there, mis an, is there an opportunity cost? An intellectual opportunity cost? For, for, for you individually, not, not even yeah. for the outside. No, world, I understand. For you individually. So my answer to that's no. I think, I think it's just a propelling uh, sort of time-saving performance augmentation and actually lets me ask questions of data that I likely would not have invested the time to write the code to do, right? I think actually the sign goes the other way in my experience. I mean, I think the most heavy and effective use for me 
has been in this data browsing domain, right? Where it's fine once you get to the point where you've crystallized the pipeline that you want to have, and then you know you write the code. But during this kind of flounder, flounder with the data stage, it is just immensely powerful. So I guess short answer, no. I haven't had that problem. Thanks. Uh, so you mentioned that um, you're trying to find ways to make it so that students couldn't circumvent learning by using generative AI. And you said, we're going to use grades as incentives. Um, I think that's a great idea. But I, I'm also curious about like what, what do you see as what Harvard brings to the table or what you know, a university brings to the table in terms of educating these people? Because yesterday we had a presentation on how an AI tutor was able to get kids to better levels of mastery and intro level physics than the Harvard professors using the best educational techniques that we know of. So will Harvard just be like an in-person testing site where like the class consists of people learning things and then come in and take tests for $70,000 a year and then get a degree at the end? Like what, what's the vision for the future of this? Yeah. So great question, Jack. I think we do, we do, uh, have the prospect of an institutional failure mode where our application and selection process stamps a capital H on people's forehead and then they go get a job at Wall Street and that's our primary institutional function, right? That would be a shame. I think where I'd like to see education in our science division go is the opportunity to do in-person, hands-on, do the science in the context of a team of colleagues, right? That's something that I think we can't replicate online. And moving our division to a much more sort of hands-on, do it mode is what I think is our, in our long-term future. Now, are we structured for that in our curricular structure, infrastructure, and staffing? No, but uh, maybe in the five months that I have left in my job, I can get us there. So one thing that resonated with me in your talk was uh, sort of the synergy of having domain expertise and knowing how to use these tools and that the whole issue of universities is we're supposed to teach domain expertise and now we have the challenge of trying to marry that with these new tools to create more effective scientists. And so I guess my question is, we've talked a lot about education, sort of K through 12 and university education. Should we also be thinking a little bit about educating the people who already have domain expertise? So our universities are filled with faculty and scientists who've got that down, but many of them have never used these tools. And part of, I think, what we're trying to figure out is how do you put together domain expertise with these tools? And maybe the place to start is with the people who have domain expertise. Yeah, so I think we do face a challenge at our institution that there's no component of the university that owns the job of training undergraduates, training staff, and training faculty in this domain, right? Um, and my hope would be that meetings like this will nucleate a community that grows out. And I think it's incumbent on us to make an honest assessment of the effectiveness of these tools, right? And my bias is that in a carefully selected subset of tasks, they're highly effective, right? If we can share that knowledge, and equally importantly, like the circuit example, this didn't work, right? Share things where, it, where it's less effective and help our friends understand where to invest their effort. I think that's part of the shared responsibility of this group. So I'll throw it back in your lap. Yeah. Yeah, if there is enough time, I hope. Uh, Christoph Paus from MIT. So I wanted to comment on just uh, uh, two little pieces where uh, you said one, well, ChatGPT will be able to very well draft a DEI statement for the students applying. And the other one was that you were um, not using this to write a reference letter. So I think that um, at least in our field, let's in physics, right, the style of what you write is really a minor let's say, perturbation on really what the content is. Mm -hmm. So from my experience, I have actually taken all of my reference letter, put it in a, in a model, and then I've tried to write a letter for somebody until I eventually realized, well, the real content you have to put yourself, meaning, well, I have to write the detail of the analysis that the person did 
the particular work that he did on the detector on on these type of things and then i was like well i'm i had to have then that bulleted list and it would just come out in the style that all of my other reference letters would basically imprint on that and I realized, well, the amount of work that I'm doing here to write that bulleted list is really the amount of work that I mostly have to do. And so it wasn't really, there wasn't really a big point. Similar to, well, if somebody wants to write a DEI kind of statement, they have to at least put the points in that they want ChatGPT to write. I mean, ChatGPT cannot write a statement and invent the context. Well, uh, uh, the, the content. Well, it could, of course, but that's, of course, then not what the statement from the student is. So there's... Um, Let's say that's, of course, new only for kind of maybe sciences where the content is really the point. While if you take literature where, well, you can make up a story and then while well, the writing is really a much larger part of what, what really the, the document is, that's, of course, much more important. Just a quick. Yeah, so my, my reaction is you've presented a counter argument claiming that it's not an efficiency gain, right? But... I think the ethical question remains hanging in the air, right? And I think, I guess what I'm trying to convey to the room is it's going to be a component of the collective opinion of this community that establishes the ethical norms and expectations. And that I think we should be attentive to that responsibility and have it front of mind as we work with these tools. Yeah, I did not try to make a comment about the ethical yeah. part. That's, of course... Uh, yep. remains out there it's just like the content versus style and okay i think last question yeah, yeah. right uh just real briefly let's can we go back to your question five um about um uh, about that pile of, of student evaluations um oh my, yeah yeah i guess my um half-baked um sort of question about is that the part that's missing here is from the student perspective informed consent and opt out right and so I think the answer to the question uh, today might be no, because we're working because we didn't tell the students before they did those evaluations what we were going to do with them. Oh, but, but we, if we, we change, we but if we change those in this process all the time. going forward, we uh -huh. would need we, you know. So I think that, that's my sort of thought, and maybe this particular case is not a good one to think with. But but going forward, uh -huh. right? I think for student evaluations, for you know anything where we would be extracting data from students that we might use differently after generative AI than before, we should be telling them what that what how that might be used. I take your point, and I'm, I'm thinking, right? So, I mean, we've historically always used student evaluations as performance evaluation yeah. for tenure, right? And whether there's an additional burden in the event we use generative AI routinely to inform the students that that will be the case is an interesting, nuanced question that's entirely appropriate. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that we'd have to do that, but I think that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to flesh out. I agree, we should move on, right? Yep. Okay, thanks. <clears throat>